Soul Fire Farm started as an idea when Jonah and I and our two infant aged children uh, were living in the south end of Albany, New York. Our neighborhood was termed a food desert by the USDA, meaning that even if you try really hard, it's almost impossible to get good food, to get fresh fruits and vegetables because of distance and transportation barriers, because of income barriers. We actually prefer the term fruit apartheid because apartheid is a human created system of segregation based on race. Certain people live in food opulence and have access to their Whole Foods and their Trader Joe's and um, you know any type of food they want at any time. And there are also a large percentage of Americans, mostly black, Latino, and indigenous Americans who don't even have enough to eat, never mind high quality food. And so the result of that is that even as our nation, rightly so, focuses attention on the rash of police killings against black and brown people and mass incarceration of black and brown bodies, we're actually five times more likely to die um, and be sick from diet-related illness than we are from all types of violence combined as black oh. people. Yeah, we have a pot of it um, under the nettle tree. When we think about ourselves as farmers, well, we try to think beyond just providing for the food needs of the community, but also what are the movement needs of the community. As much as our activism can look like it comes from a place of anger, can look like it comes from a place of righteousness, it's not until we start to look at our work being heart-centered uh, and being truly from a place of love, not just loving the people around us, but actually loving ourselves fully enough to be able to show up to the work so clearly it's not these extrinsic rewards. It really comes from this passion for what's right and for protecting what we love. And so in my case, it's the land that I love and it's people, particularly black people, that I love and want to work and defend for my life. Drown in the space. So I'm gonna ask you to just take a deep breath in and make sure you fill up your whole chest, your whole back, your whole belly, and then just let that breath out. And then let's do another one. All the way in, chest, back, belly, and out. Yeah. And one more. Breathe in all the way. Fill up your breath all the way to your toes. And out. <laughs> <laughs> and the reason that we are breathing is because when we breathe and pay attention to our breath, it reminds us that we are alive. And mm. to be alive in this moment on this planet is for a reason. <clears throat> Each of us is blessed to be here, strong in body, strong in heart. And even with all the craziness going on outside of this circle, in our society, in our world, all the heartbreak and pain, uh, we are still here. And we are still here for a reason. And today, uh, we came together and did some incredible things. We harvested a whole cooler full of food, much of which is going to go to refugee families from Syria who have resettled in our area. Joan and I both had a long history of, of farming other people's land and had a dream of having our own land. And when our neighbors found out, that we had those skills, we were really encouraged to create the farm for the people, you know, to find that land, grow food, and to bring it back into the neighborhood in the South End. So we've, we've come to understand that we did not buy the land, but actually the land owns us is way more appropriate. It was the first production year on new land, and any farmer knows that you have no idea what's going to happen. So when we arrived, these soils were as about degraded as they could be, and we've really spent the last five to six years building our soils, really seeing it as the source of the nutrition for our communities. We're growing very highly nutrient-dense food and looking at not just the amount of space we can grow food in, but actually the, the amount of nutrients per square foot. You know, this farm started out of our neighbors saying, we want to eat good food and we need a farm that's going to feed us. Uh, we want to support this vision. And we began our first doorstep delivery. What can happen on land is really different than what can happen in a conference room because you have the earth backing you up who is alive and you have the land backing you up who is a spirit and they become part of that conversation and part of the new heart that the group is creating. People will come from like everywhere all over the country um, and just to see how much they value our work and how much they want to be a part of it is really inspiring. What, what's in this anyway? Like? So it's, it's cabbage. Uh -huh. uh, and then you saw me add in the salt to yeah. this other one. So I added salt. And then right at the end, we put chilies. It's a whole mix up of chilies. It's cayenne, jalapenos, whatever we had growing. Ginger, garlic, onions. 
So there's a lot of groups that need something as simple as a place outside of the city to meet um, and good food on their plate so they can focus on their strategic thinking. Um, there are some people who need training in terms of communication, nonviolent communication or anti-oppression uh, or strategic goal setting. And so if that's what's needed, that's what we provide. A lot of the people that come here are like really driven to change the world in what I think of as a better direction. If it's a specific skill, if it's food, encouragement, um, that's what our job is as, as landowning farmers, is to really support community-based leaders in exactly what they're asking us and telling us that they need. This work is so much bigger than us as humans, as individuals. It is community, it is spirit, it is the land, and all of that is really what just keeps us going and keeps us energized and, and fired up. They've spent most of their childhood on this land. Um, in fact, we've started hiring them. So Emmett does youth groups and Nishima is, does a lot of kitchen management and she also proofreads my grants for me. It was like a week where um, groups came every day and I started like being a co-leader along with my mom for them. And I would like lead the tour. I would like if we did two tasks, I'd lead one of the tasks. Um, I just like in general help out with them and that was, that was pretty fun. So they're a healthy mix of really rooted in the land and belonging and contributing. But when I ask them if they want to farm, you know, Nishima wants to be an orthodontist and she'd be happy to have a large garden and Emmett would like to um, be a Lego engineer or a filmmaker and he'd be happy to have a large garden. We run training programs at various levels on how to farm and how to um, access land and credit so that we can become independent farmers. And we also work with a lot of black and brown youth on reconnecting to the land and particularly healing the trauma that's inserted itself between us and the land. And so when young people come, yes, they learn some farming skills and some cooking skills, but more important, it's about that reintroduction in a really whole and healthy way to the earth. So first of all, thank you all so much for coming. I know you came a really, really far away and had to get up so early in the morning. And I don't know what Ms. Maxwell told you about this farm, but we're really dedicated to food justice and dedicated to ending racism in the food system. So like everything you do today goes toward that mission. Like we're going to be in a few minutes taking care of some soil and that soil will grow food for people who otherwise wouldn't be able to eat healthy food, right? I've lived in the city my entire life, so this is definitely broader than what I'm used to. But it's exciting. You do this every day? Uh, we do, we farm every day. We don't do the same tasks every day. Oh. <laughs> I think there's a hole in your bag. <laughs> so each one of these sections needs 10 bags of limestone. Each person will take one and kind of spread it out in their section because we need this limestone not to just be dumped in one place. It's kind of like the way you put salt or pepper or adobo in your food. You like <laughs> spread it, right? You have to spread it out. You don't just like clump it in one place. On one hand, I think it's a great experience for them just to develop some type of community and togetherness and they're having a lot of fun. Additionally, it's a chance for them to actually just get in touch with the land, you know, get in touch with understanding where your food really comes from. There are children, or men and women as well, who are, you know, uh, of color. We don't get the same privileges 
as I guess someone with you know a lighter skin tone than me. The f in the food system in a whole, the product usually goes towards a small percentage of people rather than a broader percentage that needed more. We're reading a book called Fast Food Nation, and like on the chapter they were on right now, it's about the farms. So my teacher decided that hey, you know, we should go on a field trip and to a farm and actually see what the people are talking about in the book. I chose the book because many of our students are low income. Many of them don't have time to eat healthy, delicious meals because they're balancing work and family commitments and uh, going to school. In Fast Food Nation, we're talking about how the food is grown and what's inside of the food that we eat. Like all the chemicals that they add, it's not even just naturally grown anymore. But um, it, it's still good though, I'm, I'm not gonna lie, I'll, I'll still buy it. I would still like to know what I'm, what kind of stuff I'm taking a bite into, you know? If you notice like in supermarkets when you want to buy like uh, vegetables or actually healthy stuff or an organic stuff, you actually realize how much uh, pricier they are compared to like, you know, genetically modified stuff. So it's like, oh, okay, this is a little bit cheaper than the organic one. Let's go for the cheaper one because, you know, families, like, like my family, we, we had to like stretch a buck. Because they discuss food and social justice, I really began to think about Soul Fire Farm as a great experiential ed opportunity for them. So I definitely believe in what she's doing and I support it. And I didn't really, you, it, it's a wake up call because things are usually given to me. So now it's seeing like I can give back basically. When I look back on this, I'm like, wow, I really did something. Am I doing everything in my power that's reasonable without depleting myself toward those ends? Yes, I'm doing that. That is what I'm obligated to do for myself and my children and my grandchildren, and everyone's grandchildren. And if I can inspire one person or 10 people or 100 people to do the same, that collective energy might be enough to shift the machine. And if it's not, and we lose, which is possible, I would rather go out knowing that I never gave up hope, that I always did my best, that I always believed in a bright future. And in the process of, of building that bright future, I'm actually having a good life. And my children are having a really good life and the people who come here are having a better life. And so the present moment is enriched by that work, right? And possibly we'll win and all future moments will be enriched. But if not, we didn't lose anything, right? We just did our best. And that's, I think that's what we're obligated to do. Uh, do a thank you, a great, and the way this works is that every person is going to think of one word that you're grateful for, say it into the circle, and we will echo it back. So if I was grateful for love, I would say love, and you would say love, love. like that, and we'll pass it around. So. Uh, <laughs> community. 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 Action. Action. Family. Family. Hope. Hope. Peace. 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 Memory. Memory. Friends. 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 Love. Love. Knowledge. Knowledge. Food. Food. <laughs> Growth. Growth. <laughs> Education. Education. Education.